you know, you enjoy quite a few successes. Is there anything that you would have done differently if you were given a second chance? Well, y you know, I'll, I'll say here that, um, you know, perhaps I had um, engaged my political opponents in um, low-level politics as a form of, um, you know, embracing them and maybe too out of genuine friendship, even mm -hmm. though, you know, I would have been strident with my responses. It was not out of any form of um, hatred, mm -hmm. but just to be <coughs> strident and sometimes even um, entertaining. But I found myself um, literally growing out of that space, mm -hmm. not wanting to engage them in that level of politics. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, um, you know, especially in my first few years, I would have seen that maybe as or we concerned that people seen it as being snobbish, not engaging. Mm -hmm. But what I found was that um, whereas they're operating in the same space, uh, when I clapped back at them, for example, clapped back at them, they would then use it against me. Mm -hmm. So it was like a no-win situation here in which you're trying to engage them to uh, let them feel a sense of familiarity that engaging in various discussions and... Uh, and I said, some of them are really low level, and maybe I should not have descended. So I say, from that standpoint, I take responsibility. And considering how they try to use it against me, um, you know, I, I really don't have an interest in that space. So that's one thing I would have done differently for sure. Mm -hmm. I would not have engaged them to the way in which I did. Yeah. And I just want to say to all listeners um, and to all of the electors in this country, I'm not being snobbish now. Uh, it was my way to kind of interact with them, but I don't think it has really served my purpose. In fact, you found that um, it's like I was probably going down to their level. And, and again, I'm not saying this in any snobbish way. I don't think I'm better than anybody. There's nobody better than me. Uh, but I find that um, they really lack the capacity to engage in constructive debate. And perhaps I was playing their game. Mm -hmm. And uh, to the extent that, you know, they use it to ridicule me. So from that standpoint, um, I think I want to be involved in more elevated um, debates um, going forward. In fact, I've gotten so turned off by the vitriolic rhetoric that I don't even listen to them anymore. Mm -hmm. like I've gotten to the stage where I don't even want to hear them, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, and I'm hoping that there will be some alignment or realignments coming from them uh, in terms of how they approach the politics. Uh, I mean, this idea of just, you know, um, turning every issue into a partisan issue even um, the SIDS conference, for example, I don't know why they had to um, get to the stage where they're trying to embarrass the country on an international stage. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could actually sat out that one. I mean, there, there's no real need for it. Mm -hmm. And it didn't resonate. They may even hurt themselves in the process. I think people were just disgusted. My understanding that even taxi men, for example, who were supporters of the UPP, who were taking people to the conference at the time, were actually literally frowning the behavior uh, so uh, you know <coughs> we just gotta leave them in that space and um, mm -hmm. I, that I would have done differently but I'll say there's not many things that we did that I felt that we would have made any significant um, errors uh, there were many areas in which I was um, second guessed and ridiculed and with the fluction of time I think people have come to the reality that uh, myself and my colleagues would have made um, the optimal um, decision uh, so I don't know that you know, there's really any significant um, policy decision that we would have taken that mm -hmm. we would regret. Well, PM, uh, Before you go down, because these are yeah. questions from listeners, eh? and you know, they're engaging us, so we have to engage them. Yeah. So I have to ask one man and allow you. So another question is that came in that um, you would have achieved so much mm -hmm. in the last 10 years of leading not only the, your administration but also the country. What would you label? or flag as your greatest achievement or accomplishment in the last 10 years? I'll, leave it, I'll, 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 cover, I'll, I'll cover two. Uh, the first challenge that we had was to stabilize the country's economy within our first year. Mm -hmm. It was in total shamble. <coughs> and uh, I think the management of COVID, I believe that we did so admirably. So those two for me would have been the most significant uh, certainly very impactful leadership that would have mm -hmm. made a positive difference in the lives of the people of Antigua and Barbuda. And as you know, there are many other projects and initiatives that we would have pursued, but those two particular areas, I think, um, stood out for me. 
Okay, and the, so the final thing, because well, I took note, the person said, take a bow <laughs> and you can <laughs> walk across <laughs> your stage <laughs> gracefully. Well, the work is not over as yet. You know, we continue to fight um, to achieve resilient prosperity. And um, as I would have said, um, when we celebrated the 10th, year, the 10th anniversary um, last Wednesday, I want to see Antiguans and Barbudans um, becoming even more empowered. I want um, Antiguans and Barbudans to be even better culture than they are now, to be more productive, uh, to be wealthier, to be healthier. I mean, I want to see Antigua and Barbuda continue to climb that human um, development index of the United Nations to become one of the most successful small states in the world, one of the most successful developing country in the world in which we would have achieved um, resilient prosperity for the people of Antigua and Barbuda. So 